All right, this is your 10 second warning. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, here we go. It's 7.30 and we're back. <laughs> Uh, so this is the last one, last session. This has been a great weekend. We, it's, it's really been a lot of information, uh, critical information. And it's critical because um, the gospel relies on this. You know, this is, it, it's not just, it's not separated from the gospel. It's not just an issue of, of creation or age of the earth or dinosaurs. You know, it, it's a gospel issue. And that's why, for me, that's why I'm so passionate about it. And uh, you can tell by listening to, to, to Brian speak that, that he is too. And, and it's been uh, truly a pleasure. So um, today he is uh, 44 years old, way older than me, way older. So <laughs> I think it would be appropriate that we sing him happy birthday. So all right, one, two, three. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right, that that was awful. <laughs> but I hope you have a great hope you had a great birthday. So we really appreciate you, you spending time with us on, on your birthday. Um, he's been away from his family. I know he, he was gets to FaceTime him every now and then, but it's a huge sacrifice and uh, for, for our good and for God's glory. So we, we appreciate it. Um, let's pray and we'll open up this last session and, and get going. Father, we thank you for um, what you're doing here uh, in this, this church, in this local community, um, how you're, you're changing lives um, through your word and, and your people. And we thank you for, for Brian and, and the, the ministry of Answers in Genesis and their, um, their, their deep passion and love for your truth. We pray that that, that would come to the forefront tonight and that uh, you would, it would be obvious tonight, God, that, we, that we've experienced uh, you and um, in your presence and in and, uh, and your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much for the riveting singing. That was, the way you did the rounds was incredible. It was kind of like, a, kind of like an echo. It was awesome. Um, no, it's, it's truly been a good day. It really, really has. And let me say before we just kind of dive into this topic, uh, man, what a pleasure it has been to be here. I mean, truly, I've had a wonderful time. You guys have taken such good care of me. Probably gained a little bit of weight. Thanks for that. All right. Now, it's been just the, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the conversations, the encouragement. Uh, it's been good. And I tell you, to be with the body of Christ, uh, focused on the Word of God, something I've learned over the years traveling around the world and meeting Christians all over the place, is that God's got people everywhere. And it's so cool to see how God is using so many people in so many different places to bring him glory and do his will and raise families to his glory and teach Sunday school and, and do all these wonderful things. And it's just so great to kind of be a part of what he is doing and I praise of what he's doing through your church. And also, if I can just say this, nobody asked me to say this. No one paid me to say this. All right. Let me just um, encourage you that you have some really good bold leadership in this church um, you would be amazed and I literally mean you'd be amazed how many churches would not dare have us step foot in their church out of either pure disagreement and compromise or scared to death that it might rock the boat or heard someone say it might rock the tithe in the church and they're fearful how people might respond yeah um, and so there are many who won't and so to have leadership who says you know what um, God first, honor him, honor his word. We're going to stand on that, which is really what our ministry is all about, to partner with us to do that. Uh, praise God for your leadership, for your pastors, for those who are leading you. That's a blessing for you guys. It's a blessing for me and your community. And uh, just I want to thank God for them, give them some public acknowledgement for that, and pray for you guys to encourage them and help them as they endeavor 
to be bold and to equip you to stand firmly in multiple ways. That is a blessing for you guys. It's a blessing for me as well. So praise God for what uh, you are doing, and thank you for having me. It's been such an honor, such a privilege. It truly has. You just don't know. So it's been a great birthday, all right? <laughs> it really has. So we're diving into just a brand new topic, and that is one that's really big in our day and age, and that is the issue of racism and dealing with the issue of different people groups and really trying to explain from a biblical perspective different people groups, different physical traits, and, and the consequences of ideologies in regards to how you answer those questions. And before we go further on the topic, you kind of know this already, but just to be really transparent with people, I show this all the time, I, you know, I've got some personal stake in this game. So just to be really clear, so if no one's caught off guard, God has blessed my family with amazing diversity. You see my daughter Macy, my son Ian, there she is, she's about the same age. She's growing up now, my son Ian too, there she is. She's a daddy's girl all the way, by the way. She is my best friend, as you heard a while back, all right? And uh, man, she is absolutely unbelievable. So is my son. And uh, by the way, just so you know, both of my children are adopted. Nobody guesses Ian because he kind of looks just like me, all right? Uh, but they're both adopted. We got Ian the day of his birth on November 25th, Thanksgiving. We got Macy December 25th, the day after her birth, which was December 24th. So what a cool Christmas present, all right? And um, God's been so good, and they're so great. And, and so, but just so you know, I've got some personal stake in this, and it adds to the fuel or the passion maybe a little bit, but it's ultimately a biblical authority. But I, I do want to share this video really quickly just because I love watching it. Uh, this is a video of Macy around, I think, um, maybe 18 months. So she's three now, so it's about a year and a half ago. I love the video. She's got such a great laugh even then. So I just want to watch this for some joy. It'll share the joy with you. Here you go. Yeah, I'm gonna get you. I love that video so, so much. <laughs> all right. All right. So just, yeah, bear all that mind. Let that shed some joy as we get started. And we're going to deal with this issue like all the other issues by trusting God's word, standing on that foundation, and we'll have answers as we do. And again, same old song and dance as we engage this issue. All the evidence, all the people groups, all the DNA exists in the present, but is interpreted through different assumptions about the past. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And guys, these two worldviews, God's word versus man's, about the origin of people, these two worldviews could not be more different. And also the consequences of those worldviews. In the evolutionary worldview, man evolved from an ape-like ancestor. So that would be our ancestor. So technically, in evolutionary thinking, this is grandpa. All right. Ape-like ancestor, and this would be grandma. All right. <laughs> I love the disgust. All right, there you go. Poor grandma. <laughs> but if we start with the Bible, if we trust the eyewitness account of the Creator Himself, the Bible is really clear about this, that God in the beginning made two people, Adam and Eve, and from those first two people comes every person, literally, ever. And again, that means, how many races are there? One, the human race. It also means we're all related, whether we like it or not. <laughs> all right? Everybody's your relation to one degree or another. And these two worldviews really could not be more different. Reminded of a story of a little girl who went to her father one day. She said, Daddy, where did people come from? He said, Honey, God made Adam and Eve, and, and they had kids, and their kids had kids, and their kids had kids, and eventually you get the human race over time. She said, Okay. So she went to Mom. Mom, where did people come from? Her mom said, well, there were these ape-like creatures that lived millions of years ago. They began to evolve, to change over time, and eventually, over long periods of time, they changed into people. She said, okay, and she was confused, and she went back to her dad. She said, dad, wait a minute. You told me that God made us, and mom told me we came from monkeys. Who's right? He said, honey, that's easy. You see, I told you about my side of the family, and she told you about hers. <laughs> Yeah, 
All right, yeah, those worldviews have consequences, all right? <laughs> and this reality that we come from one man and one woman, it is vitally important because the Bible is clear from one end to the other that through a real man and real history, death came into this world. We all descend from Adam. That's why we're all sinners. We all die in Adam because of that. And that's why Jesus... God became flesh. He became the last Adam. Think about this. He became one of us, our relative of our blood, to pay the perfect, infinite price we can never pay on our behalf. That way, any descendant of Adam who repents and put their faith in him can be saved. But bear this in mind. If we're not all descendants of Adam, that means not everybody could be saved. That's a huge theological gospel problem. That's why we get really concerned as a ministry and we see books and quotes like this from, from the book, The Evolution of Adam by Peter Enns, works with BioLogos, be very wary of them. They're a theistic evolutionist organization, leads to a lot of compromise in many different areas. You'll see one here. But he's a Christian philosopher, professor. He says this, that evolution demands that the special creation of the first Adam, as described in the Bible, is not literal history. Reinterpret God's clear word because of man's idea. Christianity Today, back in 2011, had this as their cover. And it says, the search for historical Adam. Look at there, Adam. Looks like he could star for a Geico commercial back in the day. You know what I'm talking about? So easy, a caveman can do it. Yeah, exactly. And they quote many Christian leaders in the magazine who have compromised many of them to one degree or another. One example Carl Giberson who said this, Unfortunately, the concepts of Adam and Eve as literal first couple and ancestors of all humans simply do not fit the evidence. Actually, it doesn't fit the secular interpretation of the evidence. And guys, because of the influence of millions of years in evolution, there's a major debate amongst pastors and Christian leaders and professors as to whether or not Adam and Eve were even real people. That's happening right now in the majority of Christian academia and leadership. But here's the thing, if Adam and Eve were not real people, where did sin come from? What about death? Why are we sinners if there's no historical account of Adam and Eve? And by the way, the rest of the Bible and Jesus himself refers to Adam and Eve as real people in real history. If they weren't, the Bible's wrong and Jesus is wrong. That's a big, big problem. And again, only the descendants of Adam can be saved. The theological dominoes fall really quickly when you give up the first one in Genesis. It really does. And even though many Christians haven't realized why this matters so much, I'm going to tell you who does know. The secularist, the atheist, many of them understand why this matters so much, why it's so important. I'll give you this one quote, could show you a bunch of others from this atheist publication, which they make this statement, and they're dead on. No Adam and Eve means no need for a savior. It also means the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable. Why? Because it all begins with a myth. It builds on that as a basis. Watch this. No fall of man means no need for atonement and no need for a redeemer. By the way, they're exactly right. They understand the issue very well. The question is, do we as Christians? You see, as we mentioned Sunday morning, both Adams, the first and the last are essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, that's why it's so important that we have answers in regards to this issue. So if we're going to build our thinking from God's word and agree what God, with God's word, that there is just one race, then there are some questions we need to be able to answer in our day and age. Questions like this one. If we all come from Adam and Eve, <clears throat> where did Cain get his wife? You ever heard that question before or thought about it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's actually a very logical question. If you haven't really thought about it, it does make sense to ask it. You go to Genesis chapter 4, and you read about uh, Cain and Abel, Genesis 3, then Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, Cain kills his brother Abel. Cain then goes off, he's kicked out basically, and it says he knows his wife, and et cetera, et cetera, but hey, pause. His wife, where did she come from? You got Adam, Eve, we heard about Cain and Abel, but where did he get his wife from? Who Cain married? It's a very popular question, been around for a very long time. It was asked of William Jennings Bryan, the famous scope monkey trial over in Dayton, Tennessee. And basically this trial, really back in 1925, was putting Christianity on trial in a large way. And this was broadcast around the world. And William Jennings Bryan really represented Christianity, Clarence Darrow, uh, atheism, evolutionism. And uh, Darrow got Bryan to take the stand. 
and he asked Brian a bunch of questions about, well, how old is the earth, and who became Mary, and Brian had, Brian had no answers. And it may look like Christians could not defend their faith, and they had no answers. Why trust us about anything else? But we can't harp on really hit on Brian too much, that Brian, because most Christians today can't answer that question. And guys, I couldn't answer that question for a long time myself. I'll give you one example of this. I want to show you a video clip of a man who at least he represents Christianity to much of the watching world. And he's asked this question about who did Cain marry. I want you to hear his answer. I think about the implications of his answer. And by the way, for some reason, the video's out of sync, so the audio's off from the lips. Don't let that distract you too much, all right? Pay attention to the content of what he says. So, and now I told you you're going to be watching that. I'm sorry, but here you go. <laughs> if, if God created Adam and Eve and they had Cain and Abel, with who, that should be with whom, exactly did Cain and Abel create children with? In other words, how did Adam and Eve's kids have kids? Whoa. <laughs> that just blew your mind. I didn't get it. Probably. I didn't get it. How did Adam and Eve have kids? No, how did their like, kids have If they had Cain and Abel right. and, oh, and no, I get and it. no okay. girls. Okay. You know what? That's a good, that's a good question. It's a great question. You know what? I think I'm going to have to call the Pope on this one. Uh oh. Um, are you doubting your you faith what? now? You are. We go to the Pope line. Lifeline. You know, there is a. There's a <laughs> this is an I'm embarrassing moment for me. This is a tough moment. This is a tough question. It's a serious biblical sure, question. Absolutely. I should be able to answer absolutely. it like this. Come on. The fact is that, you know, we don't know exactly how things happened. You know, it's like, um, did, Adam, did uh, Adam have a belly button? Mm. You know, that's a whole other question. Sure. I, yeah, I don't know, quite honestly. But what we do know is that um, from individuals who decided that they did or did not want to follow the will of God came the rest of us. And Adam and Eve decided, you know what, we're not going to follow God. And we're, we want to do things our own way, and that's what we do so often in our lives. And I think the great lesson here is not whether or not Adam and Eve had belly buttons and not whether exactly how it all happened, you know, but rather, what can we learn? What can we learn? <laughs> you guys are laughing because you're like, you're not answering well, the question. You are so avoiding the question. Even he knows he's utterly avoiding the question, not answering And can I paraphrase what he basically just said there? I don't know the answer to that good, logical question about history in the Bible, but don't worry about it. Trust in Jesus. But again, if you can't trust the Bible's history, why trust anything else? And notice, who put up that video? Atheist media. Again, they understand this is a great way to undermine biblical authority. So how do we answer the question? Well, if we go to God's word, as we should, it's clear that Adam was indeed the first man, Eve the mother of all the living, Acts 17, 26, we are all of one blood. And so, understanding that truth, if we read through Genesis chapter 4, and we're trying to figure out who did Cain marry, there's a great biblical principle that the best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible. And so it compares Scripture with Scripture. And in this case, if you flip the page from Genesis 4 to Genesis 5, you'll find the answer as to who Cain married. Go to Genesis chapter 4, or chapter 5, verse 4, it says this, Adam lived many more years and had many sons and daughters. Jewish tradition says Adam and Eve had 56 kids, 33 sons and 23 daughters. The first homeschool, all right? I'm homeschooling. It's okay. I can say that, all right? But hey, you think about it. The, um, it makes sense. You're living for over 900 years with perfect bodies. Why not? It makes really good sense. But that would mean originally, originally, brothers married sisters. And all the girls said Ew, right? <laughs> Which is the right response. And that leaves a logical question, but wait a minute, can you marry your relation? Yes, no, probably only after counseling. <laughs> the answer is actually yes. Now, before you say you're from Kentucky, I knew it. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. I'm originally from North Carolina, A, but B, think about it. You have to marry your relative. If you don't marry your relative, you are not marrying a human. Now you've really got problems. And think about it, Abraham was married to his half-sister, and it wasn't an issue at all. Actually, it was not until the time of Moses, 2,500 years after creation in the book of Leviticus, that God stepped in and said, you shall no longer marry a close relative. First 2,500 years, no problem to marry a close relative. Think about this, Adam was married to his rib. Pretty closely related, right? 
And some would say, okay, but why was it okay to initially marry a close relative, but it's not okay now? The short answer is sin. The longer answer is, well, I need you to do something for me first. I need you to think poodle to fully understand the answer. You say, why do I need to think poodle? Well, because poodles are messed up. Just look at that thing. <laughs> poodles are full of things called mutations, mistakes in their genome. And you see the effects of the mutations taking place in the poodle big time. All right? And they got a lot of mutations. And actually, in truth, I'm picking on poodles, but in reality, all of us, we have lots of mutations in our genome as well. And those mutations, they mess stuff up in different ways, genetically speaking. And those mutations, they've accumulated over decades and centuries and even millennia now. They keep adding up over time. It's called genetic load. It's a big problem, by the way. And here's the deal. You don't marry a close relative today because we've had a lot of these accumulated mutations in our genome. So if you marry a close relative today and you guys have similar genetic codes with similar mutations, and you guys get married and you have a kid and you both pass on a copy of the same mutation to your child, it's very likely the child is born with a birth defect. So today, you marry someone further away in relation to you, so you get a good gene to mask a bad gene, therefore the birth defect does not present itself. This practically is why we don't marry close relatives today. But think about this. Originally, this was not a problem. You know, think biblically. Go back to Adam and Eve and the original perfect creation. Originally, no sin, no death, no curse. Adam and Eve were pre-programmed straight from the hand from God. Most likely, they were genetically perfect. What did they look like? Adam had to be 6'3 and ripped, right? <laughs> Eve, you know, probably very beautiful. What could they do mentally, physically, emotionally, even with music, with instruments, mathematically? Guys, most likely, they were the best of us. You see, I found over the years, and I think, you know, I've tried to work them on myself and thinking this way too, we tend to think, I think because of the influence of evolutionary thinking, we tend to think we're the best humans ever. I've got bad news. We're probably, genetically speaking, literally, up to this point, the worst humans ever. Because think about it. We are, genetically speaking, we're a copy of 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 a copy. What happens when you make copies of copies of copies? They get worse, right? Not better. And so, uh, yeah, that may be some bad news, but they get worse over time. But Adam and Eve, genetically perfect, and then even after they sinned and the curse came into the world, mutations would have began then, but they had been so few in number, they would not have been a problem. And it was not until thousands of years later, with thousands of accumulated mutations later, that God then stepped in in Leviticus and said, you shall no longer marry a close relative. And that was pretty easy to understand biologically, genetically. And of course, nowadays, it's been so long we've not married a close relative, it's basically taboo at this point as well. That's kind of factored in. But biblically, biologically, genetically, we can understand this. Not hard if we start with the Bible. And someone would say, okay, well, that makes sense, but then wait a minute. What about the big question for this issue? How do we explain all these different people groups all around the world with different distinct physical traits if we all come from one man and one woman? And we'll get to the biblical explanation, I promise. It is wonderful, it's glorious, and it is powerful. We'll get there. But before we get to that, I want to give you the evolutionary explanation for these distinctions and show you the ramifications of that ideology because ideas have consequences. And compromise has huge consequences in the church, especially when you have it with secular ideas. So we're going to flesh this out, and then we'll get to the good news at the end. So trust me, it'll be rough for a bit, but we'll get to some really good stuff. But starting with evolutionary ideology, we mentioned earlier, this suggests all life came from a common ancestor evolving over billions of years. We came from a common ape-like ancestor. And so if we did indeed come from a common ape-like ancestor, it makes sense in evolutionary thinking that some humans are more evolved, better than others. And that is what Darwin concluded in his book, the Descent of Man, the follow-up to the origin of species. In that book, Darwin said this, At some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Now, before I show you, who do you think Darwin thought were the civilized races of men, and who were the savages? Civilized? Europeans, English, Caucasians, like him, savages? 
them and basically anybody else. It kind of went like this. So you had the Austroloids, they were the least evolved, the Negroids right after them, the Mongoloids after that, and then finally the highest, the pinnacle of human evolution were the Caucasoids. And of course, the Austroloids, Negroids, closer to the ape-like ancestor, not as evolved, less human, Caucasoids, the most human. Darwin was an utter racist. You gotta wonder, why hasn't Darwin been canceled? By the way, he was a big sexist as well. Why hasn't he been canceled? You don't wonder about that. And let me be very clear about something. Evolution did not invent racism. What's the cause of racism? It's a three-letter word. Sin. You guys know this, I'm sure, but I've learned it over the years traveling around the world. I've traveled to many places. I've been to a lot of cool places. Kenya, South Africa, Malaysia, Japan, Australia, Alaska, not a different country, but it felt like it, all right? Many other places. And I've seen many beautiful things. I really have, but I've seen some ugly things too. And something I've noticed around the world, racism exists, newsflash to the woke, everywhere. Why? Because people live everywhere and we're sinners and what is what is racism really truly biblically at its core pride basic sentiment of racism is this i'm better than you pick your reason i'm taller than you therefore i'm better i'm shorter i'm better i come from this tribe i'm better i come from that tribe i'm better i'm lighter i'm better i'm darker i'm better my eyes look like this i'm better i come from this particular society i've had more money growing up i'm better hey i grew up poor i've got better character i'm better it goes back and forth all rooted in pride and sin so sin is a cause for racism don't misunderstand this but here's what evolution did it threw gas on the fire it gave some people in their minds a scientific justification for their racism. And that was catastrophic. Still is, by the way. Stephen Jay Gould, famous evolutionist, put it like this, that arguments for racism were common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of the evolutionary theory. And the consequences, again, are tragic. I'll just show you a few consequences of this ideology. For example, back in 1924, the New York Tribune newspaper said this, we have discovered the missing link. Really? Oh yeah, and it's alive. Oh where? Australia. The Australian Aborigines, they're the living missing links, not truly human. Actually, in the early 1900s, the Aboriginals in many Australian museums were listed as animals and not people. And because of this sort of thinking, many scientists from around the world sent people to go to Australia to dig up Austra uh, Aboriginal graves and bring back their bones to put their bones on display as proof for evolution. Some took it to the next level. Some sent hunting parties to Australia, hunting down whole groups of Aboriginal people, killed them, boiled it off their skin, brought back their bones to put on display as proof for evolution. By the way, some of those bones are still on display in museums around the world right now. Or the story of Odabinga, full-grown man. He's a pygmy from Africa. He's a short man, but a fully-grown man, had a family, was sold into slavery by his own people, then eventually made his way to America, was in 1904 at the St. Louis World's Fair, then later on he went to the Bronx Zoo, sold basically to the Bronx Zoo. While at the Bronx Zoo, he was made to live for periods of time in the monkey house with the apes. Became one of the most popular attractions at the Bronx Zoo, based on evolutionary ideology. Hitler, Hitler loved evolution. Evolution drove his mind cough, his philosophy, his goal. And the goal of the, the, the whole Nazi Reich was driven by this ideology. And you see, as you read his book, I'll give you one quote just for the sake of time. He says, no more than nature desires the mating of a weaker with a stronger individual, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. In every mingling of the Aryan, pure, good blood with that of the lower peoples, the result is the end of a culture of people. 1936, the Olympics were in Berlin. Jesse Owens, the dark-skinned American athlete, was dominating the races, races, winning a bunch of them. Hitler said this, it's not fair to make my men run against that animal. And by the way, many people of his time would share that sentiment. Hitler also said this, Hitler said a lot of things. He said, I have a right to exterminate an inferior race that breed like the vermin. Let's just pause for a second. Let's think about this for, logically for a second. If evolution is true, how could you argue Hitler 
was wrong. Think about it. If evolution is true, number one, if there is no God, then there are no moral absolutes, and might does make right. If you could push your ideas and your agenda, why not do so? That's just your prerogative, and there's no absolute standard. You can do whatever you want. And if evolution is true, then maybe some people are more evolved than others, and it's a good idea to get rid of the bad people so we can keep evolving and get better over time for the betterment of humanity. I would almost guarantee you Hitler thought he was humanity's savior, doing humanity a favor by getting rid of the weak and the poor and the worst of humanity. Now, hear me, not every evolutionist believes that. I'm just saying that's where the logic does go if you follow it through to its logical conclusion. And by the way, before we pick on Hitler too much, and we should pick on Hitler, right? it's the right thing to do, but he got a lot of his ideas from a movement called eugenics that was in place before he got started. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, eugenics means good genes, or to be well-born. And this was born out of evolution, actually by Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin. And this is the idea that some humans have better genes than others. Some are better evolved. Same basic idea that Darwin had. And the idea was this. Since we are now self-aware, we as humans, now we can guide our own evolution. This was the whole movement of eugenics. And this movement was no fringe movement. It was dominant throughout the Western world. It was really well-funded. Carnegie, Rockefeller, Kellogg, you might recognize some of those names. He had entire societies and conferences and research institutions devoted to eugenics, supposedly based on scientists like biology, genetics, anthropology, etc. There were typically departments of eugenics in almost every major university. It was widespread throughout America and throughout the West. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the founder of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, I'm not trying to ruin that for you, that's just who he is, all right? He said, we have wonderful new races of horses, cows, and pigs. Why not have a new and improved race of man? And this is the idea of eugenics. Now, here's the problem they ran into, though. They said, well, we can't just kill those with the bad genes, those lesser than, those with disabilities, those who are the minorities. By the way, for many people at that time, they looked at being a minority as a disability, so there's a conflation of language there. We can't just kill those who aren't as smart and we, whatever. We can't just kill the bad ones, the bad, the bad borns, the lesser genes. But what do we do? They got an idea. Ah, we will sterilize those born with the bad genes. That way, they can't have offspring, and those with the better genes, the good genes, will take over the population. And that's how we'll do this. And because of this, in 1907 in Indiana, the first sterilization law was put in place. 30 states followed suit, and roughly 60 to 70,000 people were forcibly sterilized in America from 1900 to 1970, based on evolutionary ideology. Ideas have consequences. Bad ideas always have victims. By the way, these ideas haven't gone away. Right now, if you go to China, they're literally oppressing the Uyghurs in particular. They're sterilizing them. And it's the same basic idea. And then a big mover and shaker in the movement is a woman named Margaret Sanger. I bet you've heard of her. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood. And she loved this whole idea of eugenics, that some were better than others. And she quoted a friend and wholeheartedly agree here with this particular quote that she had to keep her society from the biggest peril that faced our nation. We've got to protect the nation from the biggest threat that we have. What is it? These weeds in our garden, she would call them. Those who are lesser than, those who are less intelligent, those who have disabilities, those who are minorities. These are the weeds in the garden. They need to go to protect humanity. She said this when she quoted, and they actually, she's quoting a friend but wholeheartedly agreed. She said, the mass of ignorant Negroes still breed carelessly and disastrously from the portion of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly. She was a staunch racist. She actually spoke for the Ku Klux Klan back in 1926. She called the Aboriginal people a lesser human species, not actually humans. And she's the founder of Planned Parenthood. By the way, since 1973, 19 million African-American babies have been murdered through abortion. Planned Parenthood is a big part of that. And then her, these ideas had a big influence on uh, Adolf Hitler. He applied eugenics in a different way, took it to a whole other level. And it's interesting, even after Hitler was done and people realized this, the idea of eugenics and the, where it goes, 
They said, oh, this is really bad, so they stepped away from eugenics. Not Margaret Sanger. She was upset because the steam had been lost, and she couldn't really push her idea of eugenics, and she was upset about that. She voiced that very vehemently on multiple occasions because even after Hitler, she loved the idea because she was a staunch racist. And by the way, Planned Parenthood has finally admitted, yeah, our founder was very racist. They've admitted that not only in this chapter, but throughout the nation. And they've just said, just I think last week, they need to distance themselves from their founder because their founder was racist. Okay? It's one good step. I've got a suggestion. Stop murdering babies. Oh, no, by the way, do you realize that most, the majority of Planned Parenthood buildings, institutions, are usually located in populations that are very dense in minority groups? More African-American babies are killed through abortion in, or in New York than are born. You gotta wonder about the whole thing that's going on there. There's a systemic evil that's part of that. I'm sure the devil rejoices in all those stats. And these ideas haven't necessarily gone away. Frederick Osborne said this, that birth control and abortion turn out to beat the great eugenic advances of our time. These ideas are still around in different ways. As actually recently, I think about a year ago, if I remember correctly, maybe a little longer, Iceland had a news article, they're making headlines. They've abolished, they've gotten rid of Down syndrome in their in their country, which is an amazing thing, right? Wrong. How have they done it? They've aborted any baby with Down syndrome in the womb. Literally, eugenics. It's what it is. And the question then comes, okay, but then how do these ideas get so prevalent? They took root in America and throughout the West. Where do they come from? How do they get so ingrained in our thinking? Well, if you look in the textbooks and the scientific journals of the Late 1800s, early 1900s, you see why. Evolution fills all of it. A few quick examples, looking at this particular textbook, it told the students, this was used in classrooms throughout the West, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians. By the way, when I was, on, when I was in Australia and read that quote, they laugh all the time, all right? The Australians, the Polynesians, the Bushmen, the Hottentots, and the Negro tribes. That's in a textbook. Just stated as fact. Another textbook, said this, quoting an English traveler who said, I consider the Negro to be a lower species of man and can't call him a brother, because if I do, I'm allowing a gorilla into the family. These are your textbooks used in classrooms for years throughout the West. Or this quote, same textbook, quoting a missionary who said, those ape-like Negro tribes, they stand far below unreasoning animals. Or textbooks like this one, early 1900s, this one's used in the famous Scots Monkey Trial. It says this, that's just a fact. The races of man. At present, there exist upon the earth five races of people. The highest type of all. What do you think? Of course. The Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. And yes, today's my birthday, and I don't think I'm that old. That's relative, I guess, right? Depending on who you ask. Um, but I graduated high school back in 1995, and so I can remember even in high school seeing charts like this all the time. Different racial groups, they were just listed out. Cogozoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Australoid, et cetera, et cetera. It's been taught for a very long time. But it's interesting, as you reach 2000 and beyond, because of the advances in science and genetics in particular, more and more people are realizing, even the secularists are realizing, these sorts of ideas are utter nonsense and garbage, scientifically speaking even, not just biblically. Back in 2000, Dr. Venter, definitely not a believer, he was leading up the charge to put together the first draft of the human genome, a whole scientific team, it was an amazing project, and they finally got it, got it done, the first draft of the human genome. And when they got it done, they put it together, they said, oh my goodness, we've made an amazing discovery, called a huge press conference. And they said, based on the science of genetics and the human genome, we've come to find out there's only one race, the human race. <sighs> Welcome to Genesis chapter 1. I could have saved you a whole lot of time and a whole lot of money. Just read your Bible. It's right there. And I love it when we see how science again and again confirms God's word. And some of the most recent studies in genetics, this is amazing. The difference between any two people on planet Earth, it's just 0.1% of your DNA. You put that another way, every person on planet Earth, me, 
any of you, someone in California, someone in Alaska, someone in Canada, someone in South America, someone in Australia, someone in Russia, someone in Malaysia, someone wherever, every single one of us, we are all 99.9% genetically identical. There is just one race, the human race. And by the way, that lack of genetic variation shows we've not been around that long, just like the Bible implies, starting from the beginning. And secularists are really catching up to this. This is a secular quote. They're saying this. I could show you others, but they're saying, hey, the more we study genetics and the human genome, the more we see these labels used to distinguish people by race, they have little or no biological meaning. And to that I say, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We should throw this term, racist, in the trash where it belongs. I'm so glad to see the change in the scientific culture, at least on this issue. It's a good thing. But here's my question to myself, my question to you, my question to the church at large. Here's my question. Why didn't the church lead this charge? Now, don't misunderstand. Some Christians did stand, and they fall back. And you have that Christian worldview pushing back against slavery, leading to the abolition of slavery, and fighting for human rights for all people because they're made in God's image. Many Christians did do that, and that led to the abolition of slavery and so forth. But here's my bigger question, is why didn't the church as a whole, even in local communities, stand up and say, slavery or racism, one person's better than another based on the skin shade that they have, that is nonsense. We know from God's word that we all come from Adam and Eve, that we're all sinners as a result. We're equal in value because we're made in God's image. Now, why didn't we lead that charge against these heinous, evil ideas? Do you know why? I think for at least two major reasons. Number one, many people, early 1900s, mid-1900s, had accepted evolution. They compromised with the idea. Maybe God just used it. And maybe, for some reason, these people are less evolved. And they kind of embraced the ideology. So they just compromised with the secular thinking. Or, I think there are many others who said, you know what, I don't agree with evolutionary thinking, but you know what? I have no idea how to respond to what they're saying and to the current arguments of our time, how to actually rebut their ideas from a biblical worldview. I don't know, so you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. You stay over there. You have your world. You do your thing. I'll stay in my bubble. We disengage. We disconnect from the culture. Leave it to be run by the secularists with their worldview, and you look at the consequences. You cannot influence this culture for Christ by abandoning the culture or abandoning God's word as your authority. We must stand in the culture, on God's word, not of this world, but in this world as his light, as we stand rooted on his word. And we should learn a lesson, I think, from this issue and others where we fail to do so. And we should stand boldly because you realize, please hear me, only the Bible, only the Christian worldview has the real answer to racism. Only the Bible. There's not a political solution at the heart of it. There's not a movement that can do it. Definitely not a secular one. Only the Bible. Because notice, only the Bible can tell us consistently why every person is equal because we're made in God's image. Only the biblical worldview demands impartial love for all because we're made in God's image. Only the Bible can consistently explain why racism is evil and where it came from, Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered the world. Only the Bible gives us racism's real cure, a changed heart through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only answer to this issue. We've got it. Again, both Adams are essential to the gospel. We've got the answer. Let's stand, defend, and proclaim. And we can help our culture through the mess our culture's in right now. Whew! On this issue. And the debate right now is hot. Let's stand. Let's do it in love. But give answers standing on God's word. And we can. And God will work through that to change hearts and lives. And that will deal with the issues and also lead to God's glory on so many different levels. But with all that being said, let's get to the answer about how do we explain these issues from a biblical perspective. How do we explain things like different skin colors if we all come from Adam and Eve? But we've got to word the question correctly. Are we different colors or are we different shades? Are we truly red, yellow, black, and white like the good old kid song says? Here's my question to you guys. If you look at the picture, I'm in the far right-hand corner there. All right, am I white? I love how people get really quiet. I understand why people get scared, all right? I'll I'll clarify. Uh, Yeah, here we go. Am I white like this piece of paper? 
No, this is white, all right? If I'm this color white, please call an ambulance. <laughs> Maybe a hearse, it could be over by this point, all right? No, I'm a lighter shade of brown. I tan pretty easy. I, I become a darker shade of brown when I go to the beach, which is fun to do. The guy labeled black, he's not black, he's a darker shade brown. Guys, genetically, biologically speaking, we are all the same color, essentially, just different shades. It's mostly based on a brown pigment in your skin called melanin. If you have more of that pigment, you're a darker shade brown. Less of that pigment, you're a lighter shade brown. We're all the same color, just different shades. It's kind of like when you're at your house and you're going to paint that bedroom that no one ever uses, a different color finally, right? And you're going to paint it blue. You make that decision, and you go to the Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever, and you go into the paint section, you're going to pick out a blue. Great. And you get there, and there are 4,000 shades of blue. You know what I'm talking about? They're all blue, just different shades. It's the same sort of idea here. Same color, different shades. And people will say, okay, well, I mean, that makes sense, but then wait a minute. How come today certain groups of people only produce one particular shade most often? Darker shades make darker shades, lighter shades make lighter shades. Why is that? Well, to explain that, there will need to be an event in human history where the human population, the human gene pool, got split up into isolated genetic pools in different places, where in those isolated genetic pools in different places, different traits become dominant and take over the population over time. Do we have an event in biblical history where the human gene pool got split up that's right. A little hint, right? <laughs> Tower of Babel. At that particular time, roughly 100 years most likely after the flood, man rebels pretty quickly, rebelling against God, and God confuses their languages and spreads them out all over the globe. This creates isolated genetic pools, isolated populations where different traits become dominant. And these pools are isolated for at least two major reasons. These groups of people are isolated because of geography. You've just been moved to a new region, no planes, trains, or automobiles, just stick around in that particular region. They're isolated linguistically. You just got a brand new language. You're going to stick with the people who speak your new language. This creates isolated genetic pools. In those isolated genetic pools, different traits become dominant, and they take over the population. And guys, this truly is genetics 101. It's really basic at a genetic level. It's really easy to understand scientifically, biologically. This displays things like skin tones, skin shades, even eye shades, by the way. Our eyes, they're all the same shape, essentially. It's different layers of fat around the eye for numerous reasons. Same shaped eyes, ultimately. But it explains all that. It's not hard at all if you understand it from a biblical, historical perspective. And real science is catching up to this. So fun to watch, for example, and some of the, mo the most recent findings. Even secular scientists began to realize Wow, looking at genetics and the human genome, it's evident that the human genome began to rapidly diversify less than 5,000 years ago. Tower of Babel, roughly 43, 4,200 years ago. They also noted this. They said, wow, we, as we look at the human genome, it's getting worse over time, not better. We expect that from a biblical perspective. Doesn't make sense in an evolutionary perspective. Also, this is really fun. A lot of research from Dr. Nathaniel Jensen of our ministry, He's a friend of mine, great guy, smart guy, PhD from Harvard. He's written books on this. They're really good. But we can look at mitochondrial DNA, and mitochondrial DNA is passed from mother to daughter, mother to daughter. You can trace it back in time through a female lineage. In doing so, we can trace mitochondrial DNA to three females who are females to all females who are ancestors to all females living today. Who were those three females? They would be the wives of Noah's sons. And actually, you can trace those three females with mitochondrial DNA to one common female ancestor to all females living today. And if you make the radical assumptions that humans are only related to humans and assume just an average mutational rate, that common female ancestor for all females today lived roughly 6,000 years ago. And you can do the same thing with the Y chromosome for males, trace it back to a common genetic Adam, who lived at the same time as genetic Eve, mitochondrial Eve, roughly 6,000 years ago. Real science, rightly understood, confirms the Bible again and again and again. It's amazing to watch on so many levels. And so that leads to some other practical questions just very quickly. Well, then what shade, not color, were Adam and Eve's skin? By the way, if I can encourage you on this, try to change your language. I think it's an effective tool to deal with these issues and share some truth to people. So we're different shades, not colors. 
We're different people groups, not races. We're all colored, technically. If you're not colored, you're dead, all right? And then technically, we're all related. So that can help kind of spark some conversations, but maybe change our language. But what shade were Adam and Eve? Well, most likely, they were not all little A's and little B's, light shade, per se, or big A's and big B's, dark shade. Most likely, they were a nice middle brown, like the majority of the world's population today. And most likely, God put inside of them all of the genetic information necessary to produce multiple variations in humanity, even in one generation. You say, that sounds neat, but is that even physically possible? Oh yeah, we still see it today when information is available from the parents, genetically speaking. A few quick examples. Here is a set of biological twins. You heard me correctly, biological twins. The mother Jamaican, the father German. Now, Somebody did ask me one time, a student did, if those are identical twins. <laughs> I just let it go. <laughs> Sometimes better not to speak, all right? Uh, here's another set of biological twins, a little bit older, different set. Another set of biological twins, beautiful young ladies. And notice their parents, nice middle brown, like the majority of the world's population, probably similar to the skin shade of Adam and Eve. Here they are a bit older. Two sets of twins from the same parents. Notice the diversity in just one generation, two times over. Here's a set of twins I met at the Creation Museum after speaking on this very issue. And uh, you can't tell from the pictures, kind of, it's a bad shade, but they are very distinct in their skin shade, in their hair color, even eye color, I believe, and they are biological twins. Or speaking of diversity, this one's great. I love this. Here are some Aboriginal peoples. That's their real hair. Red, blonde, wavy hair. So cool. Now they look like they're about to slap somebody for taking their picture. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is the variation, all right? And I could go on, but the more we look at these sort of things, the more even secular scientists are agreeing that the differences among us, they stem from culture. There are there different cultures? Of course. But there's just one race, the human race. And so with that in mind, we should change our thinking, maybe even change our songs. I'm a big advocate for this. I do it with my kids. Even this song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. How about we make that biologically and biblically correct? How about shades of brown, dark to light? <laughs> they are precious in his sight. And I think it could be helpful on multiple levels. And then other areas of science are confirming this history of the Tower of Babel, for example. Of the thousands of languages around the world, most language experts agree, you can trace all those languages back to around an original group of 80 original, or 80 to 100 original family languages from which they diverged over time. But the number of 80 to 100 original family languages goes really well with the number of families that were spread out at the time of the Tower of Babel, if you look at Genesis 10 and 11. It's really neat. And as they spread out with their new languages, they took with them their building projects. And this is why we find all over the world these same similar structures of pyramids and ziggurats and mounds. They're literally all over the globe. Here's me at Monk's Mound right outside St. Louis. These things are literally everywhere. It's almost as if, as if humanity got together, got the same idea, and then spread out and built their own version of it in different places, post-Tower Babel. Also explains the 300 flood legends we find around the world, as we talked about yesterday. It's also really cool that if people have worked hard to keep track of their family trees and their lineage, like a kingly line over in Europe or something like that, they will typically trace their family tree all the way back to Noah, and then thus back to Adam. Just two quick examples for the sake of time. The Irish, they trace their family tree back to Noah through the son of Japheth. The Miao people of China, I love this one, they trace their family tree back to Noah. That's cool. But then they take it to the next level. They trace their family tree all the way back to dirt. <laughs> they do. They really do. I love this. They're as old as dirt. <laughs> Which seems to have a biblical reference, right? Because Adam was made from the dirt. Makes really good sense. And we could go on, but you guys understand. But at this point, if we stand on God's word, we've got answers. Real science confirms the Bible again and again and again. And again, guys, we've got the only answer to the issues of racism that so dominates our culture in our day and age. 
And then what about a couple other practical questions as we can think about all this information? What about something like interracial marriage? You think about it from a biblical standpoint, no such thing, because there's just one race, the human race. At least no physical such thing. See, there's one biological race, therefore interracial marriage, biologically speaking, is impossible. And some have pushed back over the years and said, but wait, what about, you know, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, don't be unequally yoked. That's true. With who? Unbelievers. You see, here's the deal. Biblically speaking, biological fact, as you guys know, there's one race. Spiritual fact, there are indeed two spiritual races. The difference between the two the direction in which they are racing. Some are in the light, running towards the light in Christ and Christ alone. Some are in the darkness, running towards the darkness in rebellion against their creator. And guys, the prohibition against interracial marriage in the Bible, kind of fun. It's actually, in reality, always been spiritual. Even with Israel. You go back to the Old Testament, it's really intriguing. You go back to the Old Testament and you look and you realize that Rahab, who was a Canaanite. She married an Israelite, and it wasn't a problem. Why? Because remember when the spies came into Jericho, she hid the spies, she said, hey, uh, you're God, he's obviously God, and he's going to give you this land, and you're going to defeat it, and when you do, please spare me. She believed in their God. She was of the same spiritual race. No problem to marry an Israelite. Ruth, a Moabite, hated by the Israelites, but remember what she, she said to Naomi? Actually, it's on my ring from my wife in here. She said to Naomi, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Same spiritual race. And she married Boaz, an Israelite, not a problem. And actually, both of these women are in the lineage of what really important person? Jesus, who's the Savior for all who descend from Adam if they repent and put their faith in him. So, Thinking about this, which one of these impending marriages does the Bible say do not do? Is it this one, non-Christian and non-Christian? Is it this one, Christian and Christian? Or is it this one, non-Christian and Christian? Yeah, it is that one. And you know, if you are dating at this particular time in your life, you'll realize in the Bible there's no such thing as missionary dating. And you date to marry, and you're dating a believer. If you are a believer, the Bible's really clear about that. And... Um, just a short piece of advice. I'll give you the whole thing. Just I don't care if it takes long. I love this little example. If you're dating, I, I heard this example from a pastor over in Texas. It's completely stolen, but I'm going to give it to you because I like it. Some of you may find it helpful. If you want to find a Christian spouse, here's what you do. You run after Jesus with everything you've got. As you're running, after a while, look around. Look who's running with you and wave at them and keep running. Run for a bit longer, and as you do, some of them will fall away because that's what happens. But those who keep running, get a little bit closer. How's it going? <laughs> and you keep running towards Christ. And then after a while, as they are right there and they stick around, and you're both running this direction, hey, you going this way, I'm going this way, you want to do this thing together, and you come together as one flesh. There's a picture of Christ and his bride, the church, and you glorify him in this glorious union because marriage is meant to glorify God. God and to produce godly offspring. You come together under the banner of Christ for his glory. It's a, for, and it's an amazing thing when you do it right. And Christ is a sinner. It really is. Man, marriage is so punished and discredited in our culture, but marriage is beautiful and awesome. It's not easy, but it's awesome if it's done right with Christ as the foundation for his glory. But in short, that's how you do that. Bottom line, <laughs> I love this little thing. We marry people based on their state of the soul. We pursue Christians if we are Christians. We don't base our, our, our desire on who we date based on the physical appearance. If you base your desire on who you date on physical appearance, I got two words that will change your life. Gravity wins. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I don't care who you are. Gravity wins. <laughs> You got two options. Either you die young or gravity wins. There's nothing in between. So we base our affections on what really does matter, what lasts for an eternity, our love for Christ. And actually, our love for all people should be based on what truly does matter. Let's get our eyes off the physical. 
off these physical traits and onto what really does matter, the heart, the mind, the soul. I love what God told Samuel when he sent Samuel to anoint another king to replace King Saul. And he went to David's house to find the new king. And Samuel saw one of David's older brothers, who was evidently good-looking, impressive young man, kind of a tall guy. Samuel looked at him and said, wow, that's an impressive specimen of a man. He must be the next king. And God said this to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And let us look at the heart as well. And you know what? Not just the heart, but the soul of every person. I'll give you a heavy thought, but it's an important one. Every person you ever meet has an eternal soul that will spend forever somewhere. The question is where? And there are only two options, heaven or hell. No matter your skin shade, your ethnicity, where you come from, we all have that eternal soul. Let's focus on that and be about the business of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the last Adam, our relative who paid the price for our debt on the cross. He rose again from the grave, defeating death. If you repent and put your faith in him, you will be saved. What a glorious truth and the only hope for individuals, a society, or a culture. The truth of God's word and the gospel. And again, you notice the truth, this is the common theme. We stand, we defend, we proclaim. You've got answers and God will use it for his glory. And so, Again, we've gone through all the resources a hundred times. I won't do it again. You know the website, answersofgenesis.org. I'll recommend a couple quick books that we haven't talked about yet. If you want more on this, we need to share these ideas because some of these ideas are pretty new to some people or maybe radical. Uh, there's a great book on this called One Blood, One Race. Uh, one Race, One Blood, excuse me. Written by Ken Ham, our founder, and pastor Dr. Charles Ware. Really good book. All the stuff you heard today, much more detail. It's a phenomenal resource. I encourage you to check that out. Also, there's a book for kids called One Blood for Kids. We say it's for kids, honestly, it's for kids or adults because the content's very meaty. And in some ways, the other book's great. In some ways, I prefer this one sometimes. Why? It's bigger, and it's got really pretty colorful pictures. All right? And the content's still really solid, so you'll get plenty of meat from it. And so, I mean, if it's not, you know, get it for your kids, read it with them, but it's so well done. They're both great resources, so I encourage you to check those out. The Andrews books deal with this stuff, of course. My book deals with it to a little degree. I would encourage you, this book, I deal with a lot of issues on this. Like, what about slavery in the Bible? If you talk about equality, what about sexism, supposedly, in the Bible? What about the social justice movement? And uh, it's not mentioned specifically, but Black Lives Matter. Can you, is that really a biblical thing? Answer, no. Different talk for a different time. It's actually Marxist in origination. Then, okay, I'm going to go on this diatribe for a bit. Black Lives Matter, by their own mission statement, the organization is Marxist, and they want to destroy the nuclear family. They think Christianity is a blight and a plague rooted in critical ideology, and they seek to destroy anything that has that reflection of a biblical worldview in our culture. And they're not about equality, not truly. All right, so... I won't, that's a different dog for a different time, all right? A little side nugget there, but we've got answers about all this sort of stuff in the book, and all sorts of other answers in all the other books as well. And oh, by the way, i got to mention this. This one's really fun. The Tower of Babel DVD by Bodie Hodge. Bodie's a good friend of mine. He's a speaker for the ministry. been in the ministry roughly 15 years. He's an engineer by trade, and Bodie cracks me up because you talk to Bodie for more than two minutes, he's drawing a graph somewhere. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. It could be talking about what you had for breakfast. Well, I had the eggs, and then it came down to the bacon, and then we divided. I mean, it's, that's how it's, his brain works that way. And he did this great book called The Tower of Babel. Uh, it should be here, I believe, and also a DVD version where he traces all the human populations today back in time through their name changes over time. And as you do that, you can literally trace people back to the Tower of Babel. It's really neat. It's a bit more technical, but the payoff's worth it. So if that's your jam, you'll want to check that out. What about Eight Men? Great DVD, but after David Minton, an anonymous on this, does a great job. And so lots of great stuff. And then One Blood, One Race, we have a DVD on that. Uh, my talk's not on DVD, but Ken's is, and it's fantastic. And so same content, you can get that DVD or get it on answers.tv. And some of you watched the foundation set already. So Take advantage of the YouTube special while it's here. We'll keep the bookstore open for another 15, 20 minutes. We'll make any last purchases, get stuff for other people. Uh, take advantage of the pocket guides, buy them all. Let's get rid of them. Sign up for the Answers Insider, getanswers.tv. It's so worth it. And then as we wrap up here, I want to leave you with a quote. It's a powerful quote. Uh, I think it's very applicable 
for all that we've talked about. And by the way, you guys are troopers. You've drunk from a fire hydrant for a long time now. You have hung in there really well. Uh, but I'll leave you with this one last quote. It's a quote from a hymn writer that's really talking about what Martin Luther, the Reformation leader, went through. Now, many people say Martin Luther said this. He didn't. But he said similar things, but not this. But she's referring to him and what he went through during the Reformation. And I think it's very poignant. Hymn writer says this. If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Watch this. Wherever the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. Let's realize where the attack is taking place. Let's stand firm on God's word for his glory. And as we do, he will do marvelous things. We can trust him in all this. He'll move in a mighty way. Just stand to his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you for who you are. We praise you that you are the creator. We are the creation. You've given us the honor and the privilege to reflect your image. And you tell us that we are made in your image, every one of us, and we have equal value in that particular truth. And you also let us know that we all have an eternal soul, every one of us, no matter our background, the language we speak, where we come from. And the ultimate question for every person is where will your soul be? How do you respond to Jesus? Do you repent and put your faith in him or rebel? And that is eternally crucial. And Lord, as we think about how we want to submit to you in your word and be the Christians, the ambassadors you've called us to be, Help us, Lord, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Help us to think eternally as we engage people, to think biblically, to proclaim your truth for your glory and man's good, and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that you might work through us to save people, descendants of Adam, through your blood, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. You shared your blood for those who repent, put their faith in you. Let us be obedient, faithful to proclaim that good news wherever we go, wherever we meet, realizing that's eternally crucial and we have a privilege of proclaiming this for your glory, for your namesake. There's a lot going on, Lord. We know that. There's a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion in our culture. But God, by your grace, we have the answers through you. We have the light people will need whether they realize it or not. Let us lovingly and boldly stand firm in grace and truth and meekness and in fear with courage, seeking your honor and your glory. We love you and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.